This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. Once a year, I go back to my undergrad institution. Just to check on that plate you left in the incubator or what? (laughs) Still there. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we dive into the mailbag to answer your questions. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 112. I'm Joshua Hall. And I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Hey, Dan, you made it through the clouds of pollen. Oh, it's so gross outside. Do we talk about this every year? I feel like this year is the worst. Yeah, this is the weird thing about the pollen. For anyone who's not from the southeastern U.S., every year, I mean, this is not a new thing. Every year we have these copious amounts of this thick yellow pollen. I guess it comes from the pine trees. It's the pine trees, absolutely. And there are literally clouds of it in the last couple of days. Yeah, I was driving around yesterday and there was, it was almost like there was a fire somewhere, but the fire was producing yellow smoke. <laughs> it's really disgusting. And it gets in your eyes and it's just all over everything. But I think you're right. Like this happens every year. I mean, this is an annual biological Yeah, process. yesterday though, I could see it in the air, which I think was new for me. Maybe I just don't pay that much attention during the day, but then it rains, so we're all right. Then it rains, but I feel like it always catches us off guard and we all complain about it. No, I knew it was coming. There was about a, there was a weekend where it was the right temperature. It wasn't pollen-y. The mosquitoes weren't out yet. It was glorious. And now we're, we're already into summer. Well, as soon as the pollen fades, the mosquitoes will be Right behind it. So. It's, it's, it's like <laughs> April showers and May flowers, except worse. Uh, but I, I do like this warmer weather uh, amidst all the complaining. Uh, but Dan, to keep us cool on these increasingly warm nights, we've got some listener beer. Excellent. What do we have? All right, Dan, I was out in Los Angeles for the first time. I'd never actually been to LA. Have you been to LA? I don't think so, unless I've flown through it, but I haven't been to be there. Yeah, no, it was great. I got to fly in and out of LAX for the first time. That was cool. I feel like that's a rite of passage for a traveler. And get the Uber at the door. Got the got my got my lift. But anyway, Dan, I had a great time visiting UCLA. I was actually invited to talk about the GRE. That was Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, so that was a good time. I didn't know you did that. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm-hmm. I never talk about the GRE. Um, actually, we'll talk a little bit of foreshadowing. We'll talk a little bit about it uh, later in the show. Briefly. 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 But two of my very generous hosts... Uh, Raquel and Gloria, who are grad students at UCLA, uh, were kind enough not only to uh, host me while I was there, take me to a nice dinner, and also to Diddy Reese for an ice cream sandwich. Oh, I don't know what that is. I didn't either. Diddy Reese? That's what everybody told me to go to, Diddy Reese. Okay, so if you're listening from LA, you'll, <laughs> you're shouting in your headphones. Yeah, you'll know what I'm talking about. But they were kind enough to give us some beer, send some beer home with me. Did Raquel and Gloria already take the GRE? And so this is just helping a future generation or... Apparently, they are, some of their programs are in discussion about whether or not to drop the GRE. And you may or may not know that I have been somewhat of an advocate for admissions and graduate school moving away from the GRE. I have heard tell once or twice. But yeah, so they were kind enough to send us this beer to sample on the show. And this is the Dream Speaker from Modern Times Brewery. From San Diego. San Diego. And it's an IPA. It's safe to say. There's an IPA, and this is actually a seasonal, so this is one you can't get just anywhere. So, And a very tall can with a kind of psychedelic color pattern going on. It looks a little bit like a test pattern. Yeah, it's a cool can. Dan, this is a 7.2% IPA. So, And how many ounces in my tall can? Uh, this is, I believe, a full pint, a full 16 ounces. In I'll the be tall leaving can. some of that here with you, Josh. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. One thing I had not heard of, Dan, this has... Uh, and the, the website talks about the malt profile. Uh, this had something called carafoam. Have you heard of carafoam no. malt before? Um, so Is it safe to eat? <laughs> I was looking at it. Well, it was capitalized like a proprietary carafoam. So there's Weyermann's carafoam malt. It is a drum-roasted caramel malt made from a two-row German barley. And apparently this is more recently being used by craft brewers as a replacement for a more Pilsner malt. It has a more rich, interesting flavor. So I don't understand why both of the words in its title are registered trademarks. <laughs> I don't know. What are they doing to this? 
to malt it. So spe- you Maybe said- they proprietary uh, hybridization of okay. a certain malt. I don't know. Take your word for it. Well, thank you so much to Raquel and Gloria. For, did they suggest it or you just found it while you were there? No, they already had it. They had it for Fantastic. me. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, well, this is, and they know we like IPA stand, so this is a delicious one. I don't think we've had an IPA on the show for quite a while. It has been a little while, and all of the hop varieties in this one are described as citrusy, although I do get a little taste of that piney flavor, and I'm attributing that to Cascade hops. That's my latest theory about where pine flavor comes from. Could be. I can definitely sense the higher ABV, the richness with the higher ABV. Well, cheers to uh, our friends in Los Angeles, and thank you for sharing your beer with us. Absolutely. Dan also wanted to say a special thanks to our Patreon patrons and especially our new patron, Jesus. Thank you so much, Jesus. Also, Dan, special thanks to our friends at Promega, and they're doing something really, really cool that I think our listeners might be interested in. So they are taking applications for a $10,000 grant related to real-time PCR. So for any of our listeners who whose labs or their research involves real-time PCR, you might want to listen up. And so Promega's goal is to partner with several labs to not only provide free products, but also extra levels of support, including a dedicated technical service mentor to help with assay design and optimization and troubleshooting. And depending on the geographical region, even hands-on training. So as the project in your lab progresses, they'll be sharing stories about adopting real-time PCR or changing real-time PCR reagents in your lab. So if you do real-time PCR, this might be something you want to check out. Time is running out. May 10th is the deadline. So go to promega.com slash real-time grant. May 10th. That's about a month away. May 10th, 2019 for anyone who's listening. That's in the true. Future. In, the, in the time future. All right, Dan, we do this from time to time, but we have a lot of listener questions and comments that have come in through the mailbag. So... Why don't we check some of those out? Here we go. Josh, our first email comes from David, and he had a a list of questions. I'm just going to read a couple of them, and we can talk about them. Um, One of the questions he asked was, do you have a list of graduate schools that are no longer requesting the GRE for admissions? He says uh, earlier in his email that he is thinking about applying, and he wanted to know what those schools are. Well, I'm glad you asked, David. Uh, We just mentioned the GRE a few minutes ago, and one of the things that I've been doing over the last year and a half or so is I maintain a list of biological and biomedical sciences PhD programs that have dropped the GRE requirement. Dan, there are almost 150 programs on the list now. How many was it on January 1st? I like to track your your speed to see if you're in the steep part of the curve here. Well, January 1st this year, it was pretty similar because uh, we're sort of after the admission cycle. Oh, that makes sense. I can say on January 1st last year, there was something like six. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's been quite a busy... 2018, was, there was quite a bit of movement in the moving away from standardized testing. So people will find this list by going to... Well, we will put a link to it in our show notes on this Great episode idea. for sure. Um, you can all, it's, a, it's a Google spreadsheet. Um, right now I have it, and actually for the last little while, I've had it pinned to the top of my Twitter profile. So if you go to, I'm at JD Hall PhD on Twitter. Even if you're not on Twitter, you can easily find it on the web. You can go to twitter.com slash JD Hall PhD. It is right there at the top pinned tweet and the link to that Google Docs right there. And how do people get schools into that Google Doc? I know that you keep it updated. How do you find out about these? I sure do, Dan. I have a I have a note right there on the Google Sheet. You can shoot me an email. So if your program is not on the list and you know they have dropped the GRE requirement, you can just uh, shoot me a tweet or an email and I will would be glad to add your program to the list. Important to note, it is program by program. There may be a requirement for something that's not listed here, even if it's at the same school or even, I guess in a related or similar department, right? It, it doesn't cross every department within a, within a school, right? Yeah, that is true. Also, Dan, I will point out on that Google Sheet, not only is there a list of institutions, but if you look at the bottom, there's a tab, and I've included some references of research articles, some, some of the research that's led to this movement away from standardized testing. And, and while I'm thinking of it, Josh, we speculated that if people didn't take the GRE and the school didn't require it, there shouldn't be any penalty. Have you seen, now that we've gone through a full cycle of this, have you heard from anybody that said, I didn't do it, but I kind of got feedback that I should have? I have not heard that feedback. I can say from our own 
perspective. So I directed missions for a PhD program at, at my institution. And we received about 1,700 applications this year, of which only about 20% of applicants actually submitted their GRE scores. Is that right? Yeah. So Wow. And, and I can say... It's flying blind, Josh. How are you going <laughs> to know if they're good? I don't know. We were just throwing darts, Dan. Yeah. But I can say it, it certainly, at least in our institution, did not hurt you at all if you did not submit your scores because effectively the scores that were submitted were useless because so few people <laughs> submitted yeah. them. Hard to compare. Okay, well, good. So you're putting your, your money where your science is and you're deciding on your students based on on what you believe from the research that That's you've right. read and done. Cool. Yeah. Um, David also asks, and, and this is uh, related to what we've talked about in the last few weeks about admissions, um, does age factor in admissions and science careers afterwards? I'm 37 and currently going to school um, in a post-baccalaureate computer science program, I'm interested in using computer vision in biology. If accepted to a computer science or com- computational biology PhD program, I will be 40 when I start in the fall. I'll be 45 when I'm done. I've heard of age discrimination after 50 being common. Would the odds of doing research in academia or industry go against me on account of my age? I've worked in the federal government for a number of years, so I might be able to get back to that. So from an admissions perspective, I can say this. Here in the United States, it would actually be illegal to discriminate against you based just on your age. Okay. So I want to say that from, you know, from the get go. However, I can understand how there could be concern that, you know, a lot of things that happen in admissions are sort of behind the scenes and, and can deal with unconscious bias. And so, you know, my, my point of view is I think what you can do during the application process is you will be a unique applicant, certainly. You're not the typical applicant who came right out of undergrad as a 23-year-old, or maybe you teched for a year and you're 25. But I mentioned, you know, just a second ago, Dan, I mentioned how we had 1,700 applications. And so what can be really important is trying to stand out from the crowd. And it sounds like you've had a lot of really interesting experiences in the federal government and probably lots of other things. Clearly, you are pursuing graduate school in computational biology, because you've put a lot of thought into what your interests are, what direction you want to go, probably a lot more than your typical 22, 23 year old. So I think in a lot of ways you can leverage that uniqueness about your application as a real strength and, and the experience that you have, that's going to set you apart from the typical applicant. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't think we can know about discrimination in industry based on age. I mean, there are certainly stories of people uh, particularly in tech, the tech community being passed over because of their age. But what I will say is I think most people are able to get jobs based on the strength of their network and not on the strength of their resume. And so I would encourage you, even while you're in graduate school, to make sure you're cultivating all those relationships, um, going to industry events, making sure you're having coffee or lunch with people who are in industry, doing everything you can to meet these people so that when you're ready to graduate, you have contacts that can help you out. Absolutely. I can say that one of my best friends in graduate school who joined the same time I did was a non-traditional student, and she was 10 years older than than I was and had middle and high school age children during graduate school, had to drive a much longer way than, than the typical student because she had a family and a husband who lived 45 minutes away, and she had a great graduate school experience, was very productive, and and got a faculty job as a much older applicant than the typical applicant. So This is probably my bias. I have this sense that academia will be less discriminatory based on age, but I don't know. It could be. It could I, be. So, yeah. so let's put this out to our listeners. Um, if you are in industry or academia and maybe you've seen cases where an older applicant who maybe just came out of school is applying and is passed over, let us know. Or if that is totally unheard of and your your workplace has great policies in place to make sure that everybody's considered fairly. We'd like to hear that too. We just don't, I don't know. I haven't been around enough hiring decisions uh, for people who maybe have just graduated at a later age. So can't answer that one. I I will say that if you have any previous experience that's relevant to what you're doing now, certainly make sure you, um, you leverage those experiences. Absolutely. You could be this rare unicorn being where you've got experience in the public sector. You've now got a computer science uh, bachelor's degree and PhD, you could be a pretty hot ticket. Yeah, and cast a wide net. Absolutely. All right, Dan, looks like our next message came in from Allison, and, and she wrote, Hello, guys. I love listening to the podcast and have been listening for about a year. 
I'm a graduating senior at Matt University looking to go to graduate school in the fall. I'm looking for advice on moving away from home for the first time during grad school. I am married, so that helps, but I still feel nervous and don't want to get depressed about moving away. Any advice? Thanks, Allison. Yeah, we got this email and I followed up and asked, you know, is it, Allison, is it the place that you're going to miss? The city, the restaurants, the nightlife, or is it the people? Uh, And she wrote back and said, I can totally see myself feeling down because I will no longer be living in my hometown. It's not the place itself that I will miss, although the climate where I am is pretty nice. I actually think I'm excited to move to see a new place and explore the location. Instead, it's the people. I've grown to love my university and the people of it. I have a great family also around who I visit probably once a week since they're so close. Sometimes I see them more, but usually at least once a week. In addition to my family, I have a really great research mentor who I spend time with outside of school, and I will miss him and his family. I also have many college friends who I have been with not only in college, but also in high school. I know I will make new friends in grad school and in a new city, but I also know coming home will never be the same. I know I will see it differently. I also know that it will be a lot harder to get home since I'll be in grad school. What do you think, Josh? It can be hard. Uh, Change can be really hard. Do you remember your... I, I have very distinct memories, both... Uh, in high school and in college of that last night when you're about to go away, but the whole world is staying where it is and you're the only one leaving. Do you remember those moments? Uh, you know, I definitely remember that when I left high school to go to college for the first time in that last night and thinking... Did you have a party or something? Um, I, can't even, I can't even remember that, but I can remember being in my room and you know had all the things packed up. And, and I remember thinking... This is really the end of an era a little bit. You know, I will never, like this home, this house that I've been in, that's been my home, my primary home for my whole life, will never be that thing again. It was kind of this weird, yeah, I'll always be a visitor um, in this place that was the only home I knew. And um, yeah, that that was heavy. It's heavy. Yeah, I I have the same, I I have a a much vaguer memory of high school, but I I do remember it. I have a very distinct memory of leaving college. My parents came down to help me move, uh, to move here to North Carolina. We had packed everything in the car. Some of my friends from lab and other places came over. We ate pizza on the floor because the furniture was all gone. Um, But but it's like indelible in my mind, this feeling of tomorrow, they're all going to go back to work and continue the life that we had, we shared together up to this moment. And then I'm going to be doing a different thing and they're going to continue their path. And I'm going to be on this other path. It's, it's, it is heavy. I think it's, I don't want to gloss over the fact that moving, especially if you've been somewhere a long time is hard. Yeah. I think one thing that we all have a tendency to do is we focus a whole lot on the things that we will miss on our loss, the things we will lose from, from leaving a place and moving to a new place and and we don't think about or we we overlook all of the new things. You that can't we're know what towards. they are, right? You can't yeah. be excited about them because you don't know what they're going to be yet. I, I will say this. So one thing that I think is really uh, unique and interesting about scientific training is there are all of these temporary steps. And so it's important to note that you know graduate school we talk about all the time is a temporary transition. And so wherever you go for graduate school, unless you just really love it there and get a job there and want to stay, is somewhere you'll be for just a few years. And I know that four, five, six years seems like an eternity right now, but it, it goes by in a blink of an eye. And then you move on somewhere else. Maybe you... Parts of it. Parts yeah. of it too. Yeah. <laughs> in retrospect, right? Yeah. In retrospect. Um, and then maybe you do a postdoc and you move somewhere else. And I think one advantage of that is it really is an opportunity to try out some new places in a relatively low risk way. I think compared to even let's say you got a job in a city that's far away where there's not really a, it's not a temporary thing. Um, there's a little more permanence to it. So I think one thing that, that definitely sounds true about you, Allison is you're somebody that relationships are really important to you, whether it's family relationships or personal relationships, or even building bonds with the people you work with. You mentioned your relationship with your advisor and his family. So I feel like you're the type of person who will seek out those types of relationships in a new environment, just as you have in the past. So, you know, I would encourage you a lot to, as much as possible, not just do your grad school thing, but as much as you can, make yourself part of the community. I know, Dan, that's something we did in graduate school. We certainly had people we knew in our labs, in our programs, um, but really, you know, give it a real effort to 
become a citizen of that town, become a member of that place. If there's a hobby you have um, or or something you'd like to do even outside of work, get involved in in local groups, in social events, uh, science or non-science. Join a club, go to a church. Um, I always lived with roommates that were not in the sciences. So I met people through my roommates. Uh, some of them were in grad school. Some of them were just uh, students or related to the university. But yeah, you will you will meet new people um, and form new bonds, and then you'll wonder how you're going <laughs> to leave those people behind, I suppose. <laughs> um, I, I had some thoughts for her about maintaining the connections. Um, I, I think it's great advice, Josh, to to make sure you do plant some roots where you are. If you're only living where you had been, I think you're going to, you know, you're going to be in pain a lot. Um, and there's so much going on where you're moving. But, but I think it is valuable to keep up those relationships, particularly with your family. I think it's good to have... Um, friends from high school who kind of ground you and keep you a, a part of the community you grew up in. Luckily, we have FaceTime and Skype and all the other ways of connecting where you can see a person's face. And some really great advice uh, that a, a friend of ours gave us, Josh, was to schedule, put time on a calendar every week or every month or whatever it is with specific people and say at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, we're going to call each other. So just keep that time available uh, maybe that's your parents. Maybe that's a great, good friend. And if you have to cancel it at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, fine. But then the next week, it's still on the calendar. And so in that way, you will always have kind of a standing reservation. Even if you cancel it three times out of the month, you're always going to keep up and you're not going to go six months. Uh, and once you go to six months, then it's really hard to say, oh, I should have called. Now I feel guilty. <laughs> I'm not going to call, right? And I would also say plan some times to go back. You Absolutely. Know, we We don't know how far away you'll be if you're... I mean, if you're in driving distance, um, certainly, you know, plan when you have some long weekends or holiday weekends or uh, make it a point to, to go back and visit. It'll give you something to, to look forward to, uh, for sure. But even if you're farther away, you know, putting those on the calendar, knowing, sometimes just knowing that those opportunities are coming up, that you'll get to see those old places and visit those people in person and schedule times to meet your old PI and hang out with your family um, can help did, to keep you Did you, you ever do that? Did you go back to your uh, undergrad institution or... So, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked me that, Dan. I think uh, my wife and I are very unique that we still keep in touch with people we went to high school with. Yeah. And so we still have a friend group that, you know, around the holiday time when a lot of our high school friends come back to our hometown, we're from a very small town for, to visit their own families. Uh, we make it a point about every year if we can, uh, whether it's Thanksgiving or the Christmas holidays to have at least one night we plan to all get together. And, and, you know, it's like no time has passed really. You get to, you get lots of stories to tell, but there's still that kernel of of home and sameness that goes with you over the years. Yeah. And, you know, I think we appreciate each other more. I appreciate those relationships and, and even my, my family and the place that I grew up even more coming back to it than I maybe took it for granted when I was there all the time. It's also, you know, I've had friends from home visit me. So, you yeah. know, I had a, when I was an undergrad, I had a friend who had his spring break at a different time than I did. So he came and lived in my dorm room for a while or whatever. You know, you could do the same thing in graduate school. It's fun to show the city that you are learning about to the people that you care about from your home. So I think those are opportunities to make time to get back together. And you, you just have to make the effort. And I think you will because you do seem to care about the people. Absolutely. And, and you know, I would love to know, let us know how it's going, you know, when you, you transition this fall. Um, reach out to us in in November or October, November, December. Let us know. Let us know how you're doing. Yeah. You know, the other thing, Dan, she mentioned being really close to her advisor. So I would say the research advisor I'm closest to is my undergrad advisor. And you asked if I visit. I actually make it a point every fall, once a year, I go back to my undergrad institution and just hang to check out. on that plate you left in the incubator <laughs> or what? Oh, still there. <laughs> See if my freezer box is still desiccated and <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I still get together and and actually this is what I always do, Dan. I go and this is a small undergrad institution, so the lab is made up completely of undergrads. So I have this routine. I've done this probably the last six or seven years, but I'll show up and lab meeting has always been on Friday. I go to lab meeting and hear the research the students are working on. And then my advisor and I and a couple students uh, will go out and grab a beer and talk about what's going on with them and what's going Sounds on with me. Sounds familiar. And, uh, it's, it's just great. And again, that time is so special. And, and with social media, Dan, it really is so much easier to keep up with you know, what people are up to, even when you're far apart. For those of you savvy enough <laughs> to use it. 
Not for you, Dan, but for me. Not for me. But I hear from you how things are going. I on tell you how media. everybody's doing. Yeah, it's we great. School. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what other questions do we have, Dan? Well, we had a couple comments on the website that I wanted to address. For people who don't know, you can actually leave comments in the show notes, and we get an email about them. And uh, so here's one of those. We have a website. We have a website. It's called HelloPhD.com. Cool. I'll Google that. Google HelloPhD.com. Ray left a comment on our website. He said, Hi, hello, PhD. I'm going to have an interview with my prospective advisor for a PhD. And I was wondering if it's okay to mention my experience with my previous PI during the master's program and why it resulted in my decision to shift to a different thesis lab. Thanks, Ray. So I think the question here is, I had a master's thesis. I changed labs during that process. I'm going to talk to my prospective PhD advisor. Maybe it looks bad. Yeah, should I, should I talk about my previous PI and why I had to move, or should I just not mention it and have them wonder? It, it, the implication here is something went wrong. Well, you know, I think, first of all, I mean, clearly Ray finished a master's program and did a master's thesis. So I think it's okay to, you know, lead with the positive, which is, hey, I was doing this master's research and, uh, you know, clearly it was good enough to get into this PhD program and, and you're interviewing prospective mentors. So focus on on your research interests and the work you did during your master's. And certainly if it comes up, you can be honest about it. But but it's probably not a great idea to badmouth a previous advisor. Well, or I what probably the... wouldn't lead with... You know, I mean, probably the prospective advisor is going to say, okay, tell me a little bit about <laughs> about your interests and the work you've done. Well, let me start with the fact I had this terrible relationship yeah. with my thesis advisor and switched labs. You know, Dan, maybe this is a personal opinion, but I don't think there needs to be stigma associated with switching labs. Um, you know, I think sometimes, you know, a lot of times when students choose an advisor, there's a lot more unknowns than knowns at that time. And sometimes, you know, early on in a graduate school program during that first year or two, you really discover a lot about yourself and what you're interested in and what kind of mentoring you're looking for, what kind of project you're interested in doing. And I actually wish that it was more of a straightforward process. And I know of a lot of students who recognize that the initial mentor-mentee fit that they found themselves in was actually not a great fit for them. And they advocated for themselves and had some support within the program. They found um, a different advisor, a different lab situation, and had a really successful graduate experience. And I don't think that is a black mark at all, really. I think it shows um, a lot of insight into what your interests are and what you need. That sounds right. And let me translate um, in my own words what I think you're, I hear you saying. If Ray makes this a big deal about a terrible PI, I think it's going to raise red flags. If Ray says, look, I started off on this project in this lab. You know, I learned a lot about how I learned the best and my PI had a, a different idea and I went to this other lab that was really great for me. So, so turn it into a, I learned a lot. I moved into a lab where I was successful, um, not into a gripe session about the old PI. Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, I think that makes it, uh, that's probably good advice for a job interview when you had a bad boss at the last job or whatever it is. Yeah. You don't you don't want to draw attention to the fact that maybe you have conflict with your advisor, right? I think that's true, especially because you know there are some positive experiences that have separated the time between uh, when that initial conflict or bad fit happened and and the present when you're in this PhD program. There was all this time you were in this other lab that you successfully completed your master's thesis. And so I would let that be the focus. Absolutely. You got the tailwind behind you. Just use it and uh, don't look back. All right, Josh, last one. Hi, hello, PhD. I'm an undergraduate student at a university that isn't very conducive to undergraduate research, and I have resorted to doing research independently. Since my work is in machine learning, this is an option that I am so far doing okay with. However, I'm at a point where I will benefit from collaboration with researchers working in the field, since I can't find anyone in my circle. How can I find people to author papers with? Thanks and love your podcast, Shilpa. Pretty amazing that an undergraduate is ready to write papers. I love it. Yeah, I think that shows a lot of initiative and, and true passion for for the topic, that you're in this environment where there aren't a lot of opportunities for you to just walk across campus and get some research experiences. And so you're really trying to craft these experiences for yourself and be creative and, and being resourceful to, to craft those experiences for yourself. 
So, so how do you connect with other people? Because I do agree, research is best done as a team sport. So Absolutely. And it sounds like Shelba has gotten pretty far just because it is a computer-based science with the internet and maybe learning the, the pieces that they wanted to learn about machine learning. But to collaborate, to write a paper, clearly you need a last author, right? And I don't think Shilpa is ready to be that person. Well, you know, as a starting point, I think I can give one of my common pieces of advice, and that is check out Science Twitter. So I know social media is not something every person is crazy about doing, but there really is a great, vibrant community of scientists and researchers who are on Twitter specifically. And I remember, Dan, I posted a thread, geez, it was probably a year or more ago, just asking the question whether people had made any meaningful professional connections that had led to any collaborations uh, through Twitter specifically. And I was blown away, Dan, by the number of responses I got to that post. Um, and we can put a link to that post in the show notes. But clearly, lots of really great science connections were happening um, by social media. And so um, that would be one initial piece of advice for something you could do today, if you're not already, is getting on Twitter, looking up, some maybe some individuals you know who are doing machine learning, machine learning organizations, publications or societies related to the research you're interested in. And the Twitter algorithm is actually really good when you start following a few people, recommending other people um, who are doing similar things and have similar connections. Yeah, I, and I want to follow up on the idea of looking at the primary research. If you are looking to write a paper, uh, you can go today to see what other papers are being written. You can find researchers who are doing work that sounds interesting to you that you may want to push the envelope on some specific field of machine learning, find the people doing the work and their contact information is basically part of the paper, right? I mean, you can find out where they're located at least and then go search that university website and reach out. You know, Dan, I remember when I was in graduate school and I was working on my qualifying exam and in my department, the qualifying exam, we had to write this research grant about a topic unrelated to our actual project. So we had to research and try to understand this related science that was not something we were ever going to actually do. And in, in doing that, I can remember reading some papers and I was trying to figure out, okay, well, this idea or that idea, is that something that would actually work in a research proposal? And I can remember emailing PIs of these papers I was reading at other institutions and being very upfront, you know, I wasn't trying to actually even do science at that point, but saying, hey, I have these ideas about your science. Do you think this would work or that would work? And they were so generous with their time and their information, you know, just to talk to me or email me or even I remember with one PI, I chatted on the phone just about their science. Uh, I think you're right, Dan. Researchers are fairly uh, passionate about the things they study and a little bit narcissistic. So, it's a winning combination. <laughs> you know, someone reaches out cold saying, you know what, I read your paper and I think this is really fascinating. I think you might be surprised, especially if it's the type of work that can be done um, remotely. You might actually find some people willing to mentor you and willing to work with you even just based on that shared interest in the science. Absolutely. And I work at a company now that um, we actually have people who are interns who are doing research for us in machine learning and, and related applications, and they are off at whatever universities they're at. So they're not even local to our company, but you know we find people who are talented, motivated, and passionate, and we will work with them on specific projects. So what a great resume booster or what a great entree into maybe your own PhD program by getting in contact with some of these people who are doing the work. Um, PubMed's not the place probably for machine learning. Archive, arxiv.org. If you haven't found that already, that's the place to start. You know, Dan, it seems like there's a common thread that has run through our responses to all of these questions, though the content and the Twitter. Specific... <laughs> get on Twitter. Twitter. I only said that for one. Okay. Oh, actually, no, you did have to go to Twitter to find the GRE list. So two, two questions. But, you know, Dan, when we were talking to, to David about navigating his career path as a non-traditional student, we were talking to... Allison about making connections in a new place. And when we were talking to Shilpa about reaching out to, to researchers far away from their institution, it seems like for better or worse, relationships and talking to people and reaching out to people is often the best way to go. And, and you know, that's something we could do an episode on at some point. 
that can be easier or harder depending on your personality and your comfort level. Um, I know that's something I've had to work really hard at being better at because it was it's much easier sometimes to sort of sit in your bubble. And I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I would have this assumption that I was bothering people or people oh, you're didn't very want off-putting. to talk to me. You're very <laughs> off-putting. <laughs> and now I have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think I've said this before, but for me as an introverted person, it very much was like working out. It was like working a muscle. And the more I put myself out there and had positive results, the more comfortable um, I was in doing that. So... Um, that's something I encourage really everyone to do, even if it's not your natural inclination, is if there's something you're interested in or somebody you admire their work or you want to get to know, just ask. Put yourself out there. Yep. And and the worst thing that can happen is they just don't respond. I think that's the worst. Nobody's going to take the time to scream at you over email or Twitter, right? Well, that's, that's Twitter people might yell at you, but I don't know. I don't think that's ever... I've definitely had people ignore me sometimes. And I've probably overlooked an email or two myself, um, but no one ever said... Leave me alone, dummy. Yeah, there's there's not negativity coming back. It's just nothing. So, Josh, I think I'm going to close up the mailbag. Thank you for taking the time. And would you like to to take us home here? Yeah, well, this is a great reminder to let all of our listeners know that if you have a question or a topic idea you'd like for us to discuss on the show, we'd love to hear it. You can email us, podcast at hellophd.com. You can send us a tweet at hellophd. You can leave a message on our Facebook page, Dan, or you mention, or as you mentioned, you can leave a comment on our website uh, in the show notes. It's a real thing. If you like the show, you can leave us a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We certainly love the feedback. If you'd like to support the show, you can become a patron. Simply go to our website, hellophd.com, click the Become a Patron button, or you can visit patreon.com slash hellophd. We would appreciate the beer money, and thanks to the ongoing support from all our patrons, and thanks to Raquel and Gloria for being generous hosts and sending this beer to us. All right, Josh, uh, do you have a snow shovel so I can get through the pollen out here? I have a leaf blower. Do you think that would? I don't think that it'll might work. make things worse. It yeah. kind of sticks to snow blower, maybe. Yeah, I saw a video from Tennessee of this pine tree that was cut down and it actually hit the ground, and just the cloud was unbelievable. Do we need to post this? I don't know. I can look for it. Okay, fantastic. Well, I don't think everybody in the country understands what we're dealing with, but we'll find you some videos as evidence. There we go, Dan. All right. Well, I will see you next time. See you then. 